Coming to you live from downtown Detroit, this is Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep with your host, Joel O'Connor. This is a volatile puppy here, isn't it? And Dennis Dick. I've been the penny. I will buy the stock for a penny. With everything you need to start your trading day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this Tuesday edition of Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. Spencer Israel here with Joel Elkanen and Dennis Dick on the show today. The earnings parade is continuing. We have reports from uh, RCII, AKS, Procter Gamble, Pfizer. Uh, we have news uh, to talk about in Chipotle and Qualcomm is doing a Dutch auction. We'll talk about that as well. Our guest today will be Nick Shaheen. He will join us at 835 to give us his favorite options plays in the market right now. Uh, we'll also preview Apple's earnings that they're due to report after the bell. Before we get going, just want to remind our listeners that all the information presented on today's show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice. With that said, Joel, what is happening in the overnight session? Uh, we're looking at green here. We're up uh, six and three quarters handles at 28, 10 and a quarter. Uh, we held the close at 03 and a quarter, pre market high 1150. Crude bouncing around 70, above and below, down 44 cents at 69.68. Gold down 250 at 12.29. Silver hanging out at 15.50, down four cents. And uh, Bitcoin, at least the Bitcoin futures, are losing 8,000 here. They're down $135 at 7,900. And 65, busy, busy earnings day here to Dennis. Uh, let's get a look at the uh, after hours of pre-market trading. Yeah, so we didn't have a ton of stocks last night. We've got some big ones here this morning, which we'll jump into. And then we'll have the big dog of them all is going to be Apple tonight. But let's just you know briefly recap what was happening yesterday. And you quickly saw a continuation of what we saw on Friday, which is out of growth out of the momos and into the value. And you saw a lot of stocks yesterday, defensive names catching a bit. Stocks like AT&T, stocks like Verizon, obviously going higher. Um, a lot of dividend plays, um, You know, stocks that had bigger dividends, money was trying to find a home there. And it flew out of the tech stocks right on the opening print. I kind of you know, had that feeling, You know, we talked about it on the show yesterday. I was trying to put shorts on on the tech stocks. I got pennied on a few of them right off the open. And when you get pennied, it's just basically you throw out your offer and it opens a penny up in front of you. So basically it doesn't the market maker doesn't want you to participate in the opening print because he knows you're on the right side of it. So they try to obviously push the smart money away. Anyways, uh, just missed square, just missed a few. I did pick up HUYA on a short. It opened right at the opening tick as well. Zero heat, shorted a little bit of the overall market. That worked as well. Shorting growth at the open yesterday was a big time success if you got those trades on. And uh, a lot of times we talk about the opening strategies here. And the reason we do is because it gives you an identifiable in and an identifiable out. Uh, Twitter opened flat 3417, bumped up Straight another down. nine cents. And then it was just so if you were in, if let's say you were leading way and hey, it's red on the session and you put your stop above, let's say that that 3426 probably happened right away put it a dime above that, then you had a good looking trade. And uh, this went down all the way to 3107. Um, I hopped off the Twitter puts. I looked, I I thought 32. Did you cover? Hold. Covered it, yeah, you, I covered you around 32. I'm flat. I mean, That's I, a huge trade for you though, buddy. That's a nice trade right there. Yeah. I mean, when you buy, you know, some, I think I bought them at uh, some of buck 40, buck 60, buck 80, and this thing's trading at like 10 bucks. You're what like, strike did you buy? 42. Yeah, so you you basically you know looking at four or five hundred percent on your money there a short period of time. Yeah, yep. And I I don't know. I just I I thought thirty two would hold. Obviously, I was wrong. It went down another buck. I'm not looking for any calls or any reentry yet. But it was just uh, this you know one of those lucky trades when you go into earnings, you get big. You know, uh, you have big risk and big rewards. Uh, Facebook got hit as well. Let's see where that opened into the relation. Oh man, that opened at its high tick right at 176.30. I think so. The best point is, is that, you know, to make out of this discussion is, you know, those trades off the open, they give you a shot with lower risk. You have a defined in and a defined out. 
Twitter did get upgraded here today, just quickly, Namira, but they're upgrading it to neutral, keeping their $31 price target. So basically they're saying, hey, we were right. We'll uh, go up to neutral here now. So this isn't really a convicted come in here and buy it right now. It's just basically uh, pulled back to their price where they had their target on it. So they're moving up to neutral. So basically banking their money because they must have been, were they at sell Spencer on that? Is that what they did? Sell to neutral? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so they're just basically booking their profits on it. So it's a closing trade basically for them. Um, we got Craig in the chat there. He's saying he bought Snap a couple months back and bought shares at 1370. Uh, you know, Craig, I did the almost identical thing. I did <laughs> did as well. I put I put Snap on for a swing trade there. When it was starting to look higher, they were talking about getting into gaming. It actually broke out over 14. It was starting to look good. But you know what? Facebook has put you know a damper on this, and now Twitter put a damper on it. And whenever you put something on, I always have a stop. And my stop was always going to be right the low of the move. The low of the move was down there at 1266. I put my stop at 1250 just to give myself some wiggle room. And I was stopped out of that trade yesterday. I actually almost got stopped out of it two days ago, down to 1252, then bounced a bet. I got stopped out yesterday. So I'm out of, twi of snap here now. That was a losing trade. I lost the... Um, eight or nine percent on the swing trade on it and that's what you got to do if you're trading these things don't get stuck in a trade and making it a long-term investment always have a contingency plan whenever i put a trade on investing a little bit different animal but whenever i put a trade on whatever time horizon the trade a day trade a swing trade whatever you know time horizon you have it i have a contingency plan that says if the price goes down here i'm going to get out because i don't want this you know trade to become a long-term losing investment so that was put on as a trade. When I enter something as a long-term investment, which I did in Intel a few days ago, a few days too early, obviously, um, I, I'm, I, I trade a little bit different. You know, it's in my long-term, you know, retirement account, and you know, I like it from a valuation perspective. I don't necessarily, you know, I like to try to line the technicals up a little bit, but I care more that I think the stock is just cheap. And um, you know, those trades, you know, in the long run, you know, some of them don't work out, but you know, overall, if the market continues higher, a lot of them do. Uh, so I'm willing to take a lot more heat in my investment account than I am in my trading uh, in my trading account. So I would just say is if you have this on for a long term investment, you know, I don't know if I've ever believed the long term fundamental story about Snap. So that's why it was not going in as investment was going in a trade. And the technicals have broken down now. It doesn't look good. Um, I think rallies are to be sold in this. It did get a little bit of rally off the low yesterday from twelve dollars. And they do report here in the next couple of days. So, you know, maybe you can get a lift from that, but maybe not. You know, it's kind of a coin flip on that. You know, the way Facebook and Twitter have gone, it makes me scared to hold Snap through the report. So I would just say is if you have it on for a trade, I'd probably be nervous, you know, holding on to it here. And uh, if it does go into rally mode, this 1350 area, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11 highs right in that 1350 area. So if you do get a pop off any reports, that's your resistance. Uh, it's hard to find support here because you're getting in that area that it quickly moved through. Yeah. Uh, yep. So that's why that's I did not want to be long it through this area. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You got uh, 1230. Uh, that actually, we, we took that out yesterday. We went to 12 bucks even. So hopefully uh, some buyers start up there. If not, 1170 is your next uh, daily low. But what a long consolidation period uh, before it finally made its mind up. So when its stocks are boring and they have areas of consolidation, maybe it's not good to trade when they're in the area of consolidation. But once they break out of that area, either to the upside or downside, you got a potential for a good follow through play. Go through through a few stocks that have already ported earnings here this morning. Um, there is some big ones. Pfizer, let's go to them first. They're trading slightly down here in the pre-market. It was straight up, and this is the beneficiary of the value trade. Um, there's certain stocks that are obviously going higher. Pfizer, lower PE, higher dividend. This is the kind of stock that they find a home in during rough you know waters there and that's what you know we have in the market here at least in the short term that can all change in a hurry Pfizer is leaking a little bit here on their report but again this is the kind of stock they want to own so I think I'm actually would be a buyer of the pullback I still have Pfizer my long-term investment account had in the forever I'm in from $14 sticking with it Spencer give us the details on the report the Q2 earnings per share was 81 cents which is a seven cent beat on the estimate sales of 13.5 billion versus 13.31 billion so beat on that as well. They are raising their guidance uh, for the fiscal year, uh, just the EPS by five cents on the low end of the range from 290 to 295. They are also cutting 
their sales guidance for the fiscal year. Yeah. So raising the EPS guidance, cutting their sales guidance by a, a, a trim, just just half a billion dollars. They also got a, a, a drug approval this morning as well. They're going to uh, continue to evaluate strategic alternatives for their consumer healthcare business. They expect a decision sometime later this year. So it's a wishy-washy report, yep. I will say. Um, you know, a little bit good, a little bit bad. It's not a stock that's going to push it up to new highs. I'll tell you, if you if it does go and turn into reversal mode, the first level uh, is probably going to be thirty-nine bucks because Pfizer. And I'm just trying to look at the book here right now. Yeah, so Pfizer's five hundred thousand shares in the book at thirty-nine. That's a big level for it. So that's going to take, you know, quite a bit of money to push it through there. It takes, you know, $40 times 500,000 shares uh, worth of money to push it through that price. So if Pfizer does go into rally mode, I'd expect it to stall out maybe the first time up in the higher 38s. If it blows through 39, the next level after that, if I just continue in the book, almost up to $40. There's some size of 39.50, but it's only 70,000 shares, which is nothing compared to 500,000 shares. So 39 would be my bogey on the upside. I think on pullbacks, I think you'll find buyers. You know, I don't see this thing falling a dollar or something today because I think it's the kind of stock that people want to own right now. It's the kind of stock that's been under-owned for a long time. And it's, you know, the trend is your friend on this one here. So I think as you pull back in the lower 38s or if you get lucky enough to get into the 37s, I think you find buyers. Uh, good numbers. I'm going to bring it in a little bit tighter. Because uh, yesterday's high, we're still underneath that by 19 cents. So see what happens at 38.68. You had your uh, recent high close for the move at 38.59. So you know, gets up, challenges that, then uh, taking a look at 39 uh, for support. Uh, I like the 38 dollar level. Here's your last three lows: 38.04 to 38.18. So uh, let's see how it deals with uh, yesterday's range. That, yesterday's high and yesterday's low. Uh, jump over to Procter & Gamble. Similar story. It was a beneficiary of the value trade recently here. Um, and, you know, we've, we've come back a long ways. I mean, in May, everybody hated all these stocks. All they wanted was oh, growth, growth, growth. And, you know, it's come back a long way. So it's had a decent run since May. Pulling back here this morning, we have precedence here because we saw what happened with Colgate. CL got absolutely crushed on their report, ended up by the end of the day, ended up closing green. So here's the Procter Gamble report. Spencer, give you the numbers. I'm already leaning to buying the dip, though. Uh, Q4 EPS, 94 cents. So 4 cent beat on the estimate sale, 16.5 versus 16.54 billion dollars. So a slight miss on that. The fiscal year uh, EPS guidance around 4 dollars 45 cents versus a 4 dollar 18 cent estimate. So higher fiscal year EPS guidance and mixed on the Q4 numbers. Again, another wishy-washy report, but a stock that people kind of want to own in this market. It did get into the 78 handle briefly. It's back up already at 79. Let's see where it opens. I've nibbled on for a day trade here. I've been nibbling long a little bit because, like I said, I feel like this is a stock that could turn around and go green. But I'm in a small position. So if it starts to show me a reason to add to that, I might do that. Right now, I'm just kind of almost in a feeler position in it uh, just because it's not bouncing right back. We'll see what it does in the regular session if it can come back. But I think this is the kind of stock that people want to own again. So I think, you know, people come in here and buy the dip. And uh, they did buy the dip, Dennis. I don't know if you saw the print at 77.61. When did that happen? Uh, oh, no, I did not see that. Yeah. Let's go down got... to 77 bucks. 77.61. 50. That would have been on the 51. number probably. Uh, that'd be wow. Soon, All that'd right. Be well, up. that's overdone. It got down okay. to seventy-seven, sixty-one. Wowzers! I did not realize seven thirty-five bracket. Seven. No, I did not see that, and I would have been buying hand over fist down there at seventy-seven thirty-one. So, nope, missed that one. But wow, that's uh. Well, actually, you know what? That's not entirely true. Here, where is it at? Seventy-nine oh four. Because I did buy in the lower seventy-eights. <laughs> I was just looking at. I was just looking at it because I got a small position on. I was like, oh no, I'm up a point net. So yeah, I must have bought. So seventy. I was getting handleitis here. I did see it go down there, and that's where I initial initially started nibbling was in the low 78s. I think my initially it was 78.15 when it was down two bucks. So it's okay. already come back a buck. So yep. now, well, let's see what happens. I think you got all kinds of support down there at 78. I like to pull back on this stock. If it pulls back to the 78s, give me another shot. I'll probably add to it. This is just day trade though, not long-term investment. I will probably be selling this thing after the stock, you know, if it comes back up or if it uh, takes out and starts to make new lows. It's yeah. probably stop up below 77.50. Pre-market low, uh, I said, was 77.61. That uh, coincides with your July 24th low at 77.54. Uh, now, coming back up, let's see what we got to do to get into yesterday's range. 
Uh, 79.84 was the low from yesterday. Uh, that would fill the gap. But so we'd have to see what happens if we get unchanged on the session. You know, you got a lot of day trading positions when you look at that. And I was thinking I bought it at 79 and I bought it at 78. I don't even know. <laughs> <what it> said. <laughs> and I was like, oh, no, I'm up a point in that. <laughs> and you're not so tempted just to sell time. it and move on? No, because I think it's going green. Okay. I'm hold on to it. I think it could go green. I think it could go green. I'm I, I'm obviously going to try to protect those gains as much as I can, but I'm in right now. I'm currently in 25 day trading positions. These are overnight positions that I get out. The day trading stuff and the overnight stuff I get out of the, that day. I rarely hold those stocks. There's no unless I you know designate it swing trade. You know prior to going into it, I'm probably going to you know scalp out all these. These are short term. You know, positions, I think something has went the wrong way. I think there's, you know, I have an edge on it for whatever reason. You know, and some of these are, you know, overnight positions. Like I buy Apple over and I've talked about this strategy, you know, a million times where you buy a stock before it reports, sell it, you know, 359 right before it reports because I don't want to hold it through the report. But there tends to be some alpha extracted from owning a stock a couple of days before it reports. So I typically do that. You know, I've got stocks on like AT&T right now because they're back in favor. I've got stocks, like I just said, Procter & Gamble, because I was buying the pullback this morning. I wish I would have bought more, but like I said, I only had a little feeler position in it. And, you know, I've got other stocks on. Um, I'm just, you know, giving you a little idea of, you know, what I'm holding here just for day trades overnight. Um, I've got a lot of hedged positions here, too, where um, I often trade market neutral. So when I'm long stocks, for whatever reason, like Apple, I will usually sell short cues against it because I'm trying to extract, you know, the alpha from, the run up of, of, of the stock ahead of the earnings. And if the market goes into the gutter, well, that doesn't even matter. So I'm trying to extract that alpha and that's why I, I do it hedged. And uh, just, I got to bring this stock up from yesterday. Uh, okay. Mike Hunts wants to know about AWX, Dennis. Well, we saw, talked about this yesterday. <laughs> it's $34. You know, I guess I got this one perfect. I should maybe <laughs> have been trading. I even did locates. I was trying to, I couldn't short it. I couldn't find locates, but it, it was talked about. We was $33, $34 on the show. And I said, we can't give investment advice. But I said, <laughs> I think within the next, you know, I think when we look at this two, month, from, two months from now, I think it's under five bucks. So I basically, you know, we said if we were owning this thing, we'd be selling the hell out of it. Anyways, we couldn't short it. I actually looked for locates. I thought about shorting it, but I couldn't find a locate. I didn't think it was going to be two days. I mean, it's back down there. The next day, it's down to $5. So I did not see it falling from 34 to $5 in two days. I said it was going to fall from 34 to $5 in two months. So I had it right, but my timing, I guess, was off because <laughs> I thought it was going to give some back. I didn't think it was going to give it all back in one day. So this goes to show you, you can't chase this garbage. I mean, it's a slow float stuff. People get all excited. Somebody gets burned. I mean, all this stuff. This is manipulated, probably garbage. You know, who knows what's going on behind the scenes? I mean, there's a lot of manipulation in this market that goes undetected as well. And you see stocks go from $2 to $35. Everybody's excited. The buzz is there. Um, eventually, these things usually end badly. And it, you know, it wasn't even eventually. It ended badly almost immediately for this thing. So is it going back up to $10, $12, $15? I would say probably not. I would think the path of least resistance is probably still lower, believe it or not. So we come in here at five, thinking it's going back to 10 or 15. Everybody got burned. The story's over. It's done. So I, I highly doubt it's going back to 10 or $15 again. Um, I think it's probably going to be under $5, like I said, two months from now. I think it's probably going under $5 today. Uh, uh, man, if you want to trade this thing, good luck to you. 601 was yesterday's low and then 552 was another low. So I'll just give you those daily levels. And then uh, the close, I'm sure a lot of people would like to see that closing price uh, from yesterday. And that was uh, 686. So um, boy, oh boy, this thing, or excuse me, the closing price was 606. So under pressure again. And, uh, you know, just got to, it's just better just to step away from stocks like that. Let them do their own thing. Let let people trade it that want to trade it. Very hard to define risk rewards and stocks. Almost in impossible. Like it is. Everybody, every newer trader is attracted to this kind of stuff. I was a new trader. I'll tell you back in 1996 when I started trading and in university and I had a small account. You know what stocks I traded was the penny stocks because you can make money so fast. Look, we're going to get rich making all this money. You know, and, and then, you know, I go and, and, I, and I did OK with it just because we're in such a bull market back in 1996, 1997. A lot of those ended up working out. But what I've learned, you know, over 20 years of professional trading is that this small little stuff is the hardest stuff to trade. 
This is stuff that is just unpredictable, wild swings, hard to control risk. And I will say, you know, so many people, the majority, you only hear, people don't like telling about their losers. I like talking about my losers because I like to cry, you know, or whatever about my losers on the show with you guys, you know, shoulder to lean on, whatever it is. <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't, most people don't talk about their losers. I always joke on Twitter, oh, nobody loses. You know, like, <laughs> you know, I talk about my losers. I think a lot of people think I'm a very bad trader because I talk about my losers. I think I talk about more than my winners. But, you know, I, I just think, you know, there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers. And, you know, if I analyze my statistical edge over the long run, you know, I'm not batting 100% or 90% or 80%. The best traders bat 52 or 53%. So it's going to be, you know, really, you know, how you handle your losers that define you. How do you manage the risk in something like this? I mean, it's trading probably with a dollar spread. It's wild swings. Then goes from $35 to $5 yesterday. I can't manage it. I'm a risk manager. That's what I would define myself as is risk management. I'm not in the money to, I'm, I'm not, I don't enter stocks thinking about how much money I can make. I think about how much money I can lose. When I enter a stock like that, I think I can lose the whole thing. So that's why I don't like trading that kind of stuff. If you're good at trading this kind of stuff, if you're consistently making money at this kind of stuff, by all means continue. I mean, you know, your PL talks, but if you're newer and you think this is the way to do it, I think it's not. I like trading boring, more predictable edges. You know, like stocks going to run up a couple of days ahead of the report. Maybe I can extract a half a percent or one percent from it. That's how I trade. I don't try to jump in AWX trying to make five hundred percent one day because that's trying to hit home runs. And I'm all about base hits. You know, when um, you know, when when uh, what was that book there uh, from Fernando Oliveira? He was uh, he wrote on the traders of the new era, and I was lucky enough he interviewed me for it as well. And there's 50 pages, you know, about my style of trading. He called me the base hit trader. And, and I didn't name myself that. He called it the base hit trade. I was like, you know what? That's exactly right. That's what I am. I'm always going for base hits, small little wins, small little wins, small money, making on a lot of different bets and managing the risk, staying diversified in my trading portfolio. Some people put 100% of their trading portfolio in one stock. What happens if it gets halted and it goes down 80% or something, you know, some you know, bad news or whatever? You're going to blow out your account 80% of one stock? I always stay diversified even in my trading portfolio. That's all risk management. So long tangent, story, long story short, is it's very hard to control risk on a stock like that. It's why I don't typically trade stocks like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, great example here. Uh, real quick in the chat, someone mentioned uh, Annalee Capital Management. I uh, had a great day yesterday. Well, it didn't have a real big range. And I'll lie. Yeah, and I'll lie. Um, why the range looks bigger, I guess, because it hasn't moved. I just like to see what happens. You had a 1073 high. Yeah, another pair of highs at 1073 and 1074. So last few times they went up there and caught a cold. But uh, if it can, you know, stay up here, maybe march towards uh, $11. But uh, at an important resistance area, don't know much about the fundamentals of the company. Well, NLY is, um, it's just a REIT. So there's a lot of these out there. There's a, you know, there's probably 50 of them out there. NLY is one of the bigger ones, actually. I used to trade it all the time. So again, this is just, you know, the defense play. So people will jump into, you know, a stock with 10, 11% yield, 11% yield in the case of NLY. They're looking for, for yield. They're not looking for growth. So this is not, does not have growth. It's looking for yield. And, you know, some of these stocks are great in your long-term portfolio if they can hold on. This has kind of leaked a lot over the course of the year. So, I mean, if you bought this in 2018, yeah, it's, you know, giving you 10, 11% a year, but it's also down 30, 40% from there. So you're losing a little bit on, you know, the capital. Um, Obviously, you know, at certain points in time, these stocks come back in a favor, though. And when the money is flying out of growth, it's looking for a home. We've talked about that for a while. It seems like this money just rotates. It doesn't come out of the market altogether. It can sometimes. But in the last few years, it never seems like it's coming out on any given day, just rotating into other stuff. Yesterday was rotating into more defensive names, higher yielding names, and I'll why the beneficiary of the tech wreck. That's why, you know, if they, I don't know if there was a headline on specific ground NLY. I wasn't following the story close enough, but I would just say money tends to rotate into stuff like this when it's coming out of growth. Uh, Spencer, just pull up the monthly chart real quick on this because I looked on the daily and I saw all those highs, but you like to get more, you know, a longer t- time frame. This 1074, uh, your one, two, like five of your last six monthly highs have been in that area. So very, very important level, not only on the daily, but on the monthly charts as well. Jump over to a few other stocks to report if we want to go back to the earnings parade there. Sure. Um, th- we can go, there's lots of different places, Spencer. Uh, we go Lumber Liquidators getting annihilated here. Maybe we should talk that one, double L. 
All right, let's go to LL reporting this morning. Q2 EPS of a five cent loss, of, say twenty five cent gain estimate. I, that's not good. That's either not comparable or just a huge miss. Sales two hundred eighty three uh, and a half million versus two eighty point seven. So a slight beat on the sales number. Uh, they did give some guidance uh, for the fiscal year. They say revenue growth will be in the mid to upper single digits. Uh, comps growth in the mid single digits for the fiscal year, but that that headline EPS number is not good. <laughs> That's you, you see that number. I don't care. This is this goes to show you, and I'm always going to say, you know, technical. You know, the real technical traders that just trade technicals, and that's it. It's hard to be a one trick pony because I don't care what the hell the chart looks like. When you miss that bout on earnings, it's going down. It could have the nicest cup and handle, the nicest bullish pattern. It could look so pretty. But if it reports a dog of a number like that, the stock's going down. So fundamentals trump technicals every single time. Now, that being said, after the move, you can look to technicals. You can look to levels, which Joel is great at doing. He'll look at the sell-off and say, okay, well, we found support here before. Maybe this you know, new information is going to take us to this level. You know, that's kind of how we analyze the technicals on the show. But when tech, when, that's why I don't like holding stocks on a technical trade in their earnings too, because it doesn't even matter. As new information happens, the market is going to digest that information whatever way it wants and obviously going to move to wherever it wants to go, despite whatever the technicals look like. Anyways, lumber liquidators annihilated here today. It's down 18%. Um, I'm not buying this dip, but there is some lot, there is some support down here, and Joel's going to find it for you. <laughs> it's uh, it's made a pre market low in 1970, but it's only at 1980. Well, 1990 is the last few prints here. So uh, I, I go back a long ways here, and I see a 1946 low. That was back in May of 2017. So potential short covering in that area, trying to get away from these lows. But it just looks like there's someone selling and they're selling more. So 1946, potential support point for May. And then use your half and whole numbers. Big windfall for shorts, though, here. They may want to kind of cover, you know, come in the cover at some point. Uh, huge annihilation here for lumber liquidators. Yeah, this is ugly. A um, couple questions coming from the chat, and there is some sure. good ones here. Um, Theta wants to know about the 100-day moving average. So I'll just read, read the question from the chat. So he wanted to ask you yesterday about Netflix. It's below its 100-day moving average and has been down for a long time. Would it be safe to think the stock will move back up over 360 in the next few weeks? First of all, and people you know, challenge me on this all the time. I don't look at moving averages. I don't care about moving averages. Um, I'm, Joel, do you ever look at moving averages? You, you, 200 it's a day, lagging, maybe? No, no. I mean, You're not a big a, moving average guy either, are you? Yeah, I think it's a lagging indicator, yeah. right? And yeah. you get you get the signal afterwards. So, no, I've always, you know, you know what I taught you back at Bright, you know, daily highs, daily lows, double tops, double bottoms, triple tops, triple bottoms. I mean, they're not, you know, you can get a lot fancier, but yeah, I mean, it just looks like a line on the chart that tells you what you should have done yesterday. That's a great analogy there. <laughs> so I've never been a fan. I've never made money using moving averages. I don't use them at all. I've been trading professionally 20 years. I've been profitable every single one of those 20 years and moving averages have never helped me. So I don't use moving averages. So I don't know if it's above the 100 day, below the 100 day. I don't care. Um, I look at the chart. And I use just a simple technical analysis, support resistance and trends, and that's it. Now, I'm more of a fundamental trader, though. Like, I'm a little bit, you know, I look at this and say, holy cow. I look at this Netflix chart, and I think, uh, is it oversold? Maybe, but this thing is in free fall here right now. We have a revaluation going on. We talked on this show for months. I've been saying how silly. I, I mentioned, I had to mention it five, ten times, how silly it is that Netflix was worth more than Disney. I still think that is silly. Disney is now worth more than Netflix, which I think is a little bit, you know, more of the stars in line again. I think it's asinine to, that Netflix should be worth more than Disney. So when you're buying Netflix up at $400 or $420, if you like the charts, fine, but make sure you have an out. And I think that out is long gone here now. I think the ship has sailed. I don't think it's going back to $400. Maybe eventually it will grow into that valuation, continue to grow. Love the product. Have Netflix myself. It's worth something. I don't think it's worth more than Disney, though. And, you know, at this valuation, it doesn't make any sense for me whatsoever. So I'm not coming in here as an investment at $332. I'll put anything on for a trade, though. If it starts to look like it's turned around, you know, I'll put it on a short-term trade, but I'll have a stop. I'm not going to just throw Netflix in my long-term investment account saying it's going higher because I went through 1999, 2000 when stocks got to crazy valuations. And the stocks that I bought with crazy valuations back in 1999, 2000, some of them are still down. 
So I learned the hard way that you know when you buy stocks with P's of, above 100 or more, you better hope that they're real high growth stories and that growth doesn't slow. Because when that growth slows, those stocks prices start to come down. Uh, this one really caught, Netflix caught a lot of people here, Dennis, because you had that dip on earnings and then it just gave you this nice green candle. Like, okay, buy the dip. And all the dippers were rewarded on that day. It opened uh, pretty like three bucks off its low. Next day, just double topped here at the 383, 385 area. And it's been lights out. I mean, we're already trading through yesterday's low. Um, if I had to hold on, be a little bit more patient, I would see what happens in the upper 320 handle. I see a low around 326 and 328. So, I mean, no sign that it's like turning around today, especially with the pre-market action. There's going to be some bounces, though. And oh, it's right. gonna, nothing goes straight down. I mean, we, we went from, you know, 400 down to like the 344, and then they bought the dip on the air, and it's been leaking. So there's going to be bounces. So, yeah, I'm not saying you come in here and short at 333. Because the thing just fell 30 points in a couple of days. It could continue down. I don't think there's any trade here. I think you're kind of in the middle of nowhere. So yep. could it bounce up to 340, 350 in a heartbeat? Could it go down to 320 in a heartbeat? I think it's more of a coin flip here. So I don't see, like, I like, you know, to get on the trade before it's left the station. And this has left the station now. <laughs> we don't know how far the ride is. Maybe they're going, you know, just, you know, to the next city. Maybe they're going across country. We don't know how far this train's going to go. So I like to be on the train before it leaves the station. I've jumped on moving trains before. And you know what happens? I usually fall under the tracks and get hurt. So never jump on a moving train. It's one of my cardinal rules. This train is moving. I will wait till it stops moving. And then maybe has a consolidation period before making my next trading decision on it. Yeah, I have to agree that on that one on Netflix. S&P still hanging up here, up seven bucks uh, at 28, 10 and a quarter. So, so far, uh, holding those gains from the after hours in pre-market session. Yeah, and, and you want to hear a funny story in the next two? Do we have a guest today? Nick. Oh, yeah, Nick's coming on. Okay. Well, I could, we could go through Nick and bring him in the background, but two-minute story. You want to hear a funny story? Because I, I just talked about jumping on – I used an analogy about jumping on moving trains. Did I ever tell you, Joel, the story about me actually physically jumping on a moving train? No. Did I tell you the story? Was this while you owned a Quiznos? No, this <laughs> is in high school. And this is a funny story. It might be more than two minutes, but we went on a road trip. We were going to Winnipeg. So it was a 30 hour train ride. And, you know, on the way back, we were basically like 10 hours north of Sudbury. So you're talking way north. So basically like 17 hours from Windsor, Detroit area, which is, you know, I was from Windsor. And, um, that, and the train makes a stop and the train, food on the train was really expensive. So I was talking to my buddy. I was like, hey, you know, here I am, the business guy, right? I was like, let's go get a pizza and we'll sell all our buddies, you know, pizza for $2 a slice. So the train is supposed to have a 20 minute stop. So we go like this, we get off the train in 10 hours north of Sudbury, go to the pizza joint, get the, get the pizza. And um, we're walking back, you know, after like 12, 13 minutes, we timed it. And um, my buddy says the train moving. I was like, no, it's not supposed to go for five minutes. And he's like, no, it is moving. It is moving. So we start booking as via rail. We start booking it towards the train like as fast as we can. It just started moving. So I jump up on the side of the moving train and I'm pounding on the door like, let me in, let me in. Because <laughs> all I can think about is my parents are going to absolutely kill me when they have to drive 17 hours to get me because I missed my train. So anyways, the, the, the guys on the door uh, just pounds like the conductor or whatever, or whoever, the, whatever they're called, the guy that's working the train. It's like, get off. I go, no way. <laughs> and I'm pounding. So then the train stops. It hits the brakes and uh, they get off. And then, and then they just start yelling at me. They're like, you could have fallen under the tracks. They take me in the, in the back room and they tell me they're going to arrest me when I get to Toronto because it's a federal offense to jump on a moving train. And I'm like 16 years old. So anyways, like an hour later, they come back and said, OK, well, we're going to just let this slide. But, you know, you can't jump on a moving train. And I got in trouble for my principal, got in trouble for my teachers. I got in so much trouble for that. But, yeah, I actually physically jumped on a moving train with the pizza. Uh, wait, that's not, well, two questions. One, what kind of pizza was it? And two, did you, did you get the pizza on the train? How did, I did. you do that? I got the that? pizza on the train, but I didn't have the guts to start selling it. I thought I was in enough <laughs> trouble already that I shouldn't start selling, the, selling the pizza. So we ate the pizza. <laughs> oh man. But, yeah, that, that, I was pretty, uh, whew. I was pretty nervous. When you see that train start moving down the tracks, you don't even think you're like, it wasn't moving that fast, but I had to actually like walk quickly to jump up there so and i just grabbed on the side of the handle i'm pounding on the door stop this train <laughs> so i have actually physically jumped on the side of a moving train before i didn't fall under the tracks that time but 
Um, I obviously in, in trading, I have fallen into the tracks a few times. <laughs> Do we got Nick lurking here in the background, no, Spencer? I'm, Are you going to give getting, him a call? I'm getting Nick right now. Give me one Nick second. Shaheen, he's the author of Create Income with Option Spreads. He joins the show almost every Tuesday, except when he goes on vacation, and which he did last week. So we're going to dial up Nick here. and yeah, yeah. His... Nick, where did you go on your vacation? Cancun. Oh, okay. How was it? You didn't drink the water, did you? <laughs> it's it, it's i've been there several years so i think i'm 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 used to it you sound a little bit under the weather though i am i am it's the uh going in and out over? of it <laughs> no <laughs> oh, no it's not the it's not the, all those coronas that i drank down in cancun all no it, it would be it, it would be tecate lights and uh oh, is that what they have? yeah it's even less close to water pretty much but <laughs> Okay, Nick, you're back here. Just, you know, talk about, I mean, I know you sent your notes out. You followed the markets. Do you get flat? I mean, I know you trade with a lot of positions. Just talk about a little bit of vacation planning. Do you flat things out? Do you get hedged? And then when you come back from a vacation, how do you, uh, how do you acclimate yourself to the markets? Um, well, the I, I didn't get flat, but I did structure my trades to where I don't need to babysit them. Uh, so whatever trade I took, it definitely wasn't short term. And it was based a little more on uh, some sort of a conviction level where I can not have I don't have to babysit it. Uh, but I did track the market, like you said, and nothing in the price action uh, is unusual. So if you see every dip we've had in all of the indices is back to a neckline of sorts. So whenever we break out, we have to come back and retest the footing before we go higher. Um, you know, obviously yesterday's drubbing in the tech uh, was a lot of steam let out, but that's probably the upside about it. So you have been looking for a major correction, but we've had these concentrated bursts of corrections like i don't know the market cap number that we lost yesterday but i bet you it's gigantic um given that we had major names that are uh that were down for three to five percent so maybe that's how we're having these new mini corrections that alleviate some of the pressure that's built in that people want want to see a five to ten percent correction Nick, what about these Momo names, the money flying out of them, obviously, yesterday, stocks like Netflix getting annihilated, yeah. stocks like Twitter have really been annihilated here. We know your strategy, you have a lot of times that you are willing to sell puts at lower prices. Are you out there with your put selling shoes yes. on? I, I did nibble a little bit, but nothing major because I don't want to make mistakes while I'm not here. There's always okay. time to do it. Right, because you're working here. I, Right. But if I see an opportunity, I, for example, uh, Netflix, let's look at it. I just posted yeah. a chart. If you look at yesterday's scandal, 334, and this morning it's probably 333, 334. Yeah. Um, you know, back in 522, that was a roof. So 522 is not that long ago. It's two months ago. Yeah. And, and technically, it doesn't look good. Technically, it looks like a head and shoulder, inverse cup and handle, whatever it is. You know, you, you, you're testing a neckline and you don't want to see that. But even if it loses the neckline, but if the market in general doesn't collapse, I mean, this is a this will bounce um, because it's one of those poster childs, right? Another one would be Amazon. Amazon would be a better poster child as far as uh, bullishness overall for a long time, not just recently. So, so are you writing puts on this or intending to write puts on this, or are you still I, 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 I would, I would, and I am holding some calls uh, for a bounce. So I figured this way I relieved the itch of actually doing anything with my with finite amount of uh, money at risk. Okay. And if I do anything, I go out in time. If I'm not really sure, I'll do it a debit call spread. Um, it's a lot of money to buy the stock outright, so it's pretty scary that way. It's a lot less money to buy some calls or call spreads um, in order to just participate in a possible bounce and relieve the itch of having to do something drastic. Nick, set, no that tr set that trade up for us. Do a debit call spread, you know, potentially on you okay. know, Netflix here right now. So the debit call spreads are really easy. Uh, if it's a spread, you go out, I go out in time because it's going to cost me the same if I do it for next week or six months from now, if I stay close to current price. So if, if I'm looking at um, Netflix, for example, and I wanted to do a, a participate in an upside to cover the 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 open gap that it left so, somewhere around 385, 386. So I would do a debit call spread, say around 340 or 337 and a half, depends uh, if I take a weekly or a monthly. I don't know what kind of yeah. increment they have them. And what I do is I, I buy a call, but I sell a call just above it to reduce my entry cost. 
Um, the bad thing about doing that is I limit my potential profit, but I'm reducing my cost tremendously. So if I buy a $5 wide spread, I'm going to only pay 2.5, 2.4, 2.2, depends on how much higher than current price I go. And then I sit on it. If price goes through it, my maximum potential is the other half of that $5 spread. Uh, so it, this is one way to participate in the upside without having to risk a ton of money. It's basically you make 250 or lose 250 kind of. Yeah, but that's the same as buying a stock. You know, you can either win or lose. True, so, true. great yeah, point. Th this is kind of a coin. If you're buying a stock, this is exactly the same way with a lot less money and a lot less uh, potential as far as hard dollars because you're taking less risk. That's how it works. Apple. Shuffle. Oh, go, go ahead, Dennis. Joel. Yeah, go. I was just gonna, Apple's uh, due to report tonight, uh, kind of holding up uh, near the all time highs. I mean, we are a few bucks off it. I know you like to play things into earnings. A bad couple of days here. Wow. Tons of support here. It looks like at 190 and just under 190. Any thoughts on Apple going into its report? Um, I'm optimistic. I'm holding naked calls uh, on a flyer. The the overnight reaction is arbitrary. Uh, I couldn't tell you, even if they killed the earning, I don't know how they're going to do. I can tell you one thing. I posted a chart and Apple behaves in the same manner all the time. In fact, I posted a ghost chart that you've been seeing for weeks and look at the actual price action around my ghost chart. My ghost chart is a lighter color, a little below than the current price. It's almost tick for tick. So you know, rinse and repeat for Apple. Oh my gosh, Apple's iPhone's gonna be terrible. Blah blah blah. Somebody else, NX, some some supplier. Uh, uh, what is that? Semiconductor something. Semiconductor. I can't remember what it was. Um, and they come out and say, "Goodness gracious!" And then, boom, they deliver results that are incredible. So for the long term, Apple will be fine. Uh, it's 18 PE, so not you're not paying up. But I, I should break the 200 soon enough. I mean, if the markets continue to crawl up, Apple will be higher. There's no doubt about it for the short term, medium term, long term. But really long term, I think Tim Cook needs to change his ways. How much uh, do you put into like valuation? Like, you know, you just looked and you just talked, you know, Apple P and 19, <laughs> but then you're talking Netflix on a bullish trade too. <laughs> when you're writing puts, how much yeah. are you considering valuation when you're putting your money at risk? It's everything because I want to know what I'm buying. So if I'm selling conviction puts in, in size, I want to know I'm buying a value. So if I sell Apple puts at 160, I want to know that, hey, it's worth 160. And it should be because it's 18 PE. It's a mature company. Yeah. The downside risk for the, for the next year is limited. I know I can manage my way out of those puts if I put the stock at 160. In fact, people would love it if they own the stock at 160. Um, with Netflix and, and Amazon, it would be more of a trade. So I would have to hedge it somehow. And exactly. sometimes, gotcha. sometimes if I sell outside, if I sell way out there, puts it, and collect 20 bucks on Amazon, that's a $20 buffer I have. But I even do something more, which I buy, I call them sacrifice puts. So I buy shorter dated puts. It's money thrown, but it's pennies. If we crash, I'm covered for that crash. Right. But, it, but it's not protection because there, there is, there is overlap that's empty. There's no overlap all the way, I should say. So you're not comfortable writing naked puts on crazy valuation <laughs> stocks? I wouldn't be. Um, but uh, if you believe in the company, like I know if Amazon gets slashed 40%, which it has several times, um, it would be temporary unless, you know, Bezos leaves or something like that. Jump over here just to other stocks that are going to report tonight. And I just want to get your thoughts here on Baidu, B-I-D-U. We haven't talked China stocks on the show for a few days here. It's been kind of leaking. Um, we often talk Baba, but we don't give Baidu the love that maybe sometimes it deserves because this one's uh, traded a lot as well. It's going to report here after the bell. You playing this one at all? B-I-D-U. I haven't done anything because I literally, this is my first five minutes on, back. On, my, on my desktop and I've been working with a small surface and a phone. So it's pretty, <laughs> pretty difficult to do. Although, hey, kudos to the surface. That thing rocks. Uh, it's a shiny and it's portable. Battery is great. <laughs> Commercial for surface. Um, <laughs> so, so Baidu has technical, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it fell to 240, but it wouldn't change my opinion of the company. It would probably be buying opportunity for me down there. Down uh, here, it's a coin flip. It's right in the middle of a recent range. So take your guess. I mean, it's uh, anybody's guess what we're going to do overnight as far as price reaction to the um, earnings. So sometimes I look back and I see how they tend to react. And the last couple of earnings were up. 
the one before that was down. The one before that was up. The one before that was down. So there you go, almost a coin flip right there. So just look at the market, see what the market is expecting. And I don't assume I'm smarter than them unless I know something, which I don't. Uh, Nick, quick question out of the chat here. If you bought a put in Apple and it whooshes down, would you buy the stock on the cheap since you have a put as insurance? I would uh, probably sell puts against my long put, which is basically the saying the same thing. Locking in. Okay. So yep. this way, if, if I have the put, then I've got nothing at risk. In fact, I can just lock in my profits that way. All right. I just want to ask you about this whole rotation here uh, from the tech into value. Uh, AT&T uh, come back after its report. GM has rebounded off its report. You know, some of these other stocks, you see this is just something, you know, temporarily parking money here until the mobiles come back at, uh, you know, uh, you know, at viable levels. Or you think the market's just, uh, you know, the overall some of the bigger money's taking a more conservative stance in the market. I'd be careful listening to all the expert opinion. You know, they've declared the fang dead quite a few times. If the fang is dead, the whole market is dead. That's my opinion. You can you imagine a market rallying when the the fang and apple are falling for an extended period of time? I just can't see it. Um, AT and T is not bouncing yet. I would be cautious. It's uh, lower lows, lower highs. Okay, a couple of green ticks. Uh, GE, it's a mystery to everybody, so I wouldn't listen to any experts out there. Just go with your gut. Um, it seemed to have found a floor, but that has happened several times before that. So I've heard rhetoric uh, from the experts in the media saying that um, you know it's a rotation into value. It's this, it's that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't believe it yet. So we we I, I still don't believe it. I mean, I haven't seen anything in the price action, and I see any. I don't see any fundamental reason for it. Rates are not going anywhere anytime soon for as long as bonds outside the US are, are this low. They don't pay anything if not negative. So physically, there'll be a bid on our bonds, which physically hampers rates from going up, regardless of what the Fed does. Got a tough chart for you here. Uh, who wants to know about Constellation Brands here? Stock making a new low on the session. STZ. Um, Flat on the session here, but Oof. made a new mo low of the move yesterday. I mean, do you sit back and wait for 200? I see 204.60 is a monthly low. Uh, any thoughts on Constellation Brands, STZ? Well, you named the pivot point. Uh, it was a roof back in 2017, September. It was the low tick on one day in 29 on the, the depth of the correction. It's pretty darn close to it. I don't know it fundamentally, but it, technically, you know, it should, in theory, find some support soon uh, without a headline coming. And it looks like earnings already went. So if I know this, if, I, if somebody knows this, the stock, they can decide whether this is a good place. Technically, it's OK as long as the floor holds. If it doesn't, then 197 is not that crazy to see, which is another pivot point eyeball for me. Do you put any uh, any uh, credence? Seven different insiders purchased four and a half million dollars in shares last week. You pay any attention? AT&T. Oh, well, that was for AT and T. Yeah. that's that's good news. I mean, uh, if they are buying, then they don't know anything bad is happening. Otherwise, they would be. It, it will look at the level as to who is buying. So, I it's an encouraging sign. So AT and T. I don't know what kind of uh, fundamental it has. I can't remember. Let's see. Uh, as far as PE is concerned, but it's one of those company that has been companies that has, has it has been forever uh, around. So 16 PE trailing 16, 17, it's not too shabby. So if somebody wants to take a flyer on AT&T, this being uh, a bottom of sorts, it, it's as good a place as any. I mean, this has been tested. I don't like the fact that they breached below the August of 2015 low. If you look at the weekly, I mean, I thought that was a pretty bad period of time and here we are breaching it but if you pull a monthly chart it's towards the it's at the low end of things so things would have to get pretty bad so let me post a monthly chart just to give you a, a perspective where we are um, let's see AT&T monthly chart so yes there could be technical downside if this level is uh, is lost but it'll probably take a big news item or the market actually I, correcting. I think the only way it probably starts breaching through 30 is if the people start getting worried about the dividend. 
6.22%. I mean, there's not any significant worries about that right now. I've said long term, I'm not sure about it. Short term, there's no concerns really about it, which is why you're starting to probably see that level defended too. I think it's a trade I'm comfortable with them in the lower 30s. Long term yeah. investment, I still don't know. Like, I think those margins are getting squeezed, you know, and that's why I know uh, on some of these, you know, telecom companies, they bought a lot, they've got a lot of debt there. They keep buying, you know, keep trying to acquire, trying to get the growth, but DirecTV didn't work out for them at all. And, you know, there's a lot of other things. Time Warner maybe is going to work out better for them, but that's still to be determined. It's just a debt they're swallowing makes me a little bit scared as a shareholder. Yep. Um, I mean, it would take a big news item, like you said, and the dividend will definitely do it. So let me put it this way. If I'm holding AT&T stock, I'm not selling here if I haven't already sold. So I'd be if I want if I'm nervous, I'd buy some puts probably to protect me. It, it won't cost much. Uh, it's a low price to um, ticker relatively speaking and a low beta ticker so you're not going to pay up like uh, let's say amazon puts or something like that uh so why not sleep well in owning some puts just to cover you through a period of time where if i'm unsure uh so that's that's one way of putting it i i don't have a knock against it there's nothing obvious against it now i posted a fear chart so fear needs to be lidded here uh before uh, the bulls start giving away the reins they're still in control uh in my opinion I mean, there's a lot of bad rhetoric. If you listen to the coverage yesterday, you'd think that the market collapsed. And the Dow, the, the S&P, even the small caps were barely down. The small caps were up half a percent, I think, in the morning. So yes, we had a giant release of energy in, in, the, in the tech wreck that we had. But Nick, it doesn't speak to the whole market. Nick Shaheen. Thoughts on Facebook. Oh, go for it, Nick. One more. Oh, Facebook. Uh, Facebook. Okay. So I attempted, I sold puts when it first fell and they paid pretty quickly. Uh, so I bought some protection behind them just to cover, like I said, some sacrifice puts. I didn't take a big position because I'm not certain they are, they have their head screwed on straight. Right. Uh, I, I, I said it before on your show. I didn't like how they folded immediately said we're hiring 20,000 people. That's 40,000 new eyeballs that are going to be looking through my stuff if I use uh, Facebook. So I, it's censorship. They should just let it be the way it is and say they should have stomped their feet and they said we didn't have a data breach we had somebody that cheated us and and we <laughs> whose dog is that and then uh so it, they just folded too quickly and now they're worried about doing the right thing and I, I did not like the message from the cfo it was misconstrued i think he was saying that growth is going to be slower he didn't say business is going to suffer he just said the way we're growing we can't maintain it with all of these things we're trying to do so if the markets are higher and this is it for the headlines, I think Facebook would be a decent bet upside from here. But again, I would take time to be right. The dog is barking on Facebook. All right, Nick. Thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Yeah, that was too easy. Thanks so much for the time, Nick. Have a good one. Absolutely. All right. Uh, guys, can we cover uh, Qualcomm? I want to hit that before the end of the show. Yeah, for sure. They are uh, commencing with a Dutch auction, uh, tender offer up to $10 billion. Uh, it is going to be priced between 60 and 67.50 per share. So I've got the chart up right now. Dennis, why don't you uh, break this one down for us? Um, I'll tell you, and if any companies are listening to, if you want to get your stock price up, the best way to do it, you know, if you're doing buybacks, the best way to do them to get the stock price up is with the stock on. If, if, if your point to doing a buyback is to try to like pump your price up, <laughs> the best way to do it is with the Dutch auction because you get so much more movement from it than just a regular buyback. And the reason for that is investors get excited about the potential of potentially getting 6750 for their shares. So the way Dutch auction works is they give you a range. And if you're a shareholder, you can tender into that Dutch auction. you got to give a price, though. So let's say, hypothetically, I want to tender my Qualcomm. We have a price of $63. If they can buy the 10 billion at 62.50 and your price is 63, you will not get filled at all. But if you put a price of 62 and the, and the Dutch auction price comes out to 62.50, you'll get 62.50 because it's better than your price of 62. So you obviously can't get less than your price, but you can get more. So the trick is kind of to offer it out at a price that you want to sell it at. But if you want to participate, you ought to have it low enough that it's not going to end up, you know, you're not going to miss it. So what investors are doing, you know, is they throw out these prices, you know, what they're willing to sell it as, tender it out. So 60, 61, 62, 63, 64. There'll be some people that put 6750. They're probably not going to get 6750. Maybe at the end of the day, they can buy the 10 billion for 62 bucks. 
So anybody who's below 62 who's offered 60, 61, 61, 50, 61, 75, will get filled at 62. Anybody who went 62, 50 with the price isn't going to get filled. So it's kind of like a game a little bit, you know, how high, you know, how high you can put your price to participate, but making sure you still participate. That's at least how the ARBs are doing it. Um, now, as an, you know, as a, a shareholder of the company, the reason it goes up more than I think a typical buyback is because of that potential. People see the 67, 50 is like, wow. Qualcomm could end up going to 6750 on this. So it tends to push the price out more. This buyback for Qualcomm was announced last week, wasn't it, Spencer? Wasn't it announced that they were going to do the buyback last week? Yes. So they already had a nice lift from it. You can see on the spike in the stock price when they announced the buyback. Now they announced this Dutch auction. It goes up another 3% because everybody's like, you know, the investors are applauding it because, yeah, Dutch auction. Now, I don't know if it's cheaper to buy the stock this way, but if you want to get the share house price higher, investors are rewarding those and you're seeing it more and more abby just did one you're seeing it more and more lately because the response the market's response to the dutch auction is very positive it really pushes your price higher i'm not sure they can't buy it cheaper in the open market though so i think if you're if your goal is to just buy your stock as cheaply as you can i'm not sure the dutch auction is the best way to go but if the goal is to push your price up as much as you can which is a little bit manipulative i think the dutch auction does that well <laughs> that's my thoughts uh on the dutch auction uh, I'll just give you the price action here, uh, 64.40. Uh, that's your pre-market high. Pretty good volume trading uh, here. Uh, 63.76, I'm keeping on that. That was the former high of the move. We're holding above that. So uh, hold above that, uh, ways to go on the upside. I would take a look at like Herbalife. I know that did a duck auction. And to, to me, at Herbalife, I thought that ended up really driving the stock price up. Uh, I think so they the, do. They drive yeah, price. Yeah, they do. So do a little homework in other stocks that uh, have done this uh, Dutch auction tender offer for, for their shares. Yeah, and if you own shares, you'll get a notice and you can tender out into that and you give your price. You set your tender price of what you will, will be willing to sell. Maybe you don't want to sell. You're just going to hold on through the whole thing. I own some Qualcomm in my invest portfolio. I'm probably not going to sell it at all because I know we had Sean Udall on this show last week and he said this was his pick. And I, it's in my long-term retirement account. I put some Qualcomm. I had it on for two. I had it on for a trade. I had it on for a long-term uh, investment. Two different accounts. In my long-term investment, I plan on holding, and I'm still going to hold it. In my trade, I sold it. So I'm out of my Qualcomm for my trade. But in my long-term investment, I held on to it. And Sean was saying this was his pick. He thought long-term this was you know best bang for the buck as a value play. Sean's a big value investor over there, too, more of a contrarian. And you know what? He's been right. I mean, he was on our show. was 58 bucks. This was his pick. It was like the next day it went to like 64. I was like, holy cow, this shot, you know, it's good. But anyway, it's obviously coincidental that it, you know, obviously had some good uh, numbers and announced a buyback. But, you know, that being said, you know, um, I, I'm I'm a fan of Sean Udall long term. So he's a believer. I'm a believer. Uh, do we have any uh, any ratings that we wanted to touch on or uh, any imbalances? There is some ratings here. Um, you know what? We haven't talked Chipotle yet. We should talk. Give, give a minute to Chipotle here because okay. there's multiple headlines here. First, last night, it was announced, Spencer, the details, Ohio store closing. Yeah, this is a, a broken by Business Insider. They reported that an Ohio restaurant shut down after customers got severely ill. Uh, some context on this, though. Uh, Business Insider, for whatever reason, is, is all over the Chipotle closing story because they reported uh, similar instances in July uh, and December of last year. Uh, and both times that happened, the stock recovered within a week. Uh, so there, mm -hmm. there was that story yesterday that uh, it hit the stock after hours. And then this morning, uh, Jeffries upgraded. I, I think not related to the to the to the news. Yeah, yesterday. I think completely unrelated. Uh, Jeffries upgraded Chipotle to a buy, and they raised their price target from four hundred to five fifty. So other things being equal, if you didn't have the Ohio store closure, Chipotle would probably be up seven or eight bucks at this point. But because of the store closing, it's down 12 points. Um, you know what? The valuation on here has always been the reason that I don't buy this thing. I don't understand why they give it the valuation that they do. So it's just too, too expensive of a stock for me from a valuation perspective. That being said, I agree with you, Spencer. It seems like every time we get these you know, news and people fear, oh, the Ecoli is going to be back, it's shrugged off within a few days. So I think... Uh, if the market holds up and, you know, if, if value, if, you know, if money keeps flying out of everything growth or everything with a higher valuation, that's not going to help Chipotle. But if, you know, the market holds up here, uh, I think Chipotle is one that will potentially bounce back as well. 
Uh, pre-market low after hours low comes in at 446 and a quarter. And then if you go right to your daily charts, you have the pair of lows at 446 and one at 447 and a quarter. So if you're looking at to bring it in on the cheap, uh, that's your area, 446 to 447. Coming back on the upside here, you did have a bounce off that low at the 460 area that looks like that bounce, uh, that that high at 460 may be holding up for a little bit. Looking to do some work under 450. Guess who just went green? Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble is green, guys. So I'm now up almost three points on this trade. Wish I would have wish I would have went convicted and went full size on it. But I went a slight, just a, a smaller position there. But I'm now up. I bought it in the 78, lower 78s here. It's now in just, just kissed 81. So it's 80.95. So I will be selling this here today uh, into this. My call was, I think it comes back and goes green. It just did that. So I'll probably wow. be trying to work out of it somewhere in here. Good thing I didn't fade you on that one. And uh, when we looked and we were discussing this one on Skype, I, I mentioned it on uh, Stocks and Jocks too, Dennis. So uh, thanks. Thank you. It make me look good on that one. Nice. Spencer, you want to wrap up the show here uh, a minute late and uh, preview uh, Wednesday show? Yeah, sure. Tomorrow we got a good show. So Apple reports after the bell to prepare us uh, or, or to recap that for us. Or uh, uh, We're going to have Mike Olson on with us. He is the uh, analyst there at Piper who covers Apple, and he's going to break down the earnings report uh, from Apple. Uh, today, he'll join the show tomorrow at 8.35. But if you want to count out to any part of today's show again, you can do so on our podcast, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, uh, TuneIn, and Google Play or YouTube. Just search for Pre-Market Prep on any of those platforms. Thanks to our guest, Nick Shaheen, today. Thanks to everyone in our chat. Please remember that all the information, material, and content from our show is for informational purposes only and not meant to be investing advice hope everyone had a good morning hope you have the good rest of your day and we hope you join us again on wednesday